Matthew chapter 5, we left off about uh, verse 33. Uh, Jesus is contrasting the interpretation of the law of Moses that the people have heard. And he is speaking the truth concerning what was actually said up against the interpretation of that that's been preached among the rabbis or preached from the rabbis. So he's clearing up misconceptions about the law of Moses and also he's doing a second thing. He's preparing people for the coming of his, of his kingdom. Because many of the principles and teachings of the Old Testament you'll find in the New Testament. In fact, we're reading a New Testament book of Matthew. So there would be some teachings that would be in the New Covenant, the New Testament of Jesus Christ, that are very similar to that found in the Old Covenant. So Jesus is preparing people for that coming kingdom and for the coming of the New Covenant. In verse uh, 33 through 37, he talks about taking oaths and swearing. He said, again, you have heard that it is said. That's what people are saying he is using that phrase, this is what you hear, but here's what it actually means. Again, you have heard that it is said of those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. He's referring to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 7 and Leviticus 19 and verse 12. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, neither by heaven for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Verse 36. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. Or evil, some translations might say. So is Jesus here forbidding all oaths? As some people have interpreted it, there are some religious groups, and I believe it's uh, those who are derived from the Mennonites, the Quakers, things of that nature, that you find more on the uh, East Coast and the old Pennsylvania country, things of that nature. They will not take an oath at all. Even in, even in a courtroom situation, they will not take an oath. And they base it on uh, this passage of Scripture. Is he forbidding the taking of all oaths? If the answer is yes, then you couldn't get married. You couldn't get married. Because you're taking an oath. You're entering, to, entering into a covenant with your wife. What he is dealing with here is the flippant use of oaths, of taking an oath to solemnly swear to do something. And in, in the common practice of the day, if you swore or took an oath by heaven or by the throne of God, you were obligated to perform that oath. It was binding. You had to do it. But if you took an oath, by the earth or Jerusalem or, or something of that nature, something lesser, then you could break it. You weren't really obligated to keep it. So he's dealing with the flippant attitude of taking oaths. In fact, in the Old Testament, you find various oaths or um, vows that are taken. Uh, the Nazarite vow, in which a person would refrain from from wine and things of that nature, would not cut their hair. Uh, Samson was uh, a Nazarite from his, from his mother's womb. And so you have various oaths in the Old Testament. He's not forbidding all oaths. He is dealing with the, the flippant nature by which people will make an oath and then break it. He's just basically saying, say yes or no. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. But if he's forbidding all oaths and all vows, then there's no way a person could get married because that is an oath. That is a vow a person takes. If you look at the book of James, <clears throat> James talks about this. James 
James chapter 5 and verse 12. James says, But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or earth or by any oath, but let your yes be yes and your no no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. So the, the seriousness of, of making an oath is what's underscored. When you read the book of Hebrews, you read that God took an oath by Himself, because there's no one greater than God, that Christ would be a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. You find that in the book of Hebrews. He swore. He took an oath. And He swore by Himself because there's no one greater than God. So, or rather, God didn't do anything sinful or wrong. But he's what Jesus is talking about here, in verses 33 through 37, is the taking of an oath and then willing to break it. And he says here, don't take an oath, verse 36, by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Well, someone might say you can dye it, can't you? Yeah, but you're just covering up the obvious gray. You're not changing the actual color of your hair. You're just covering it up. You cannot make one hair white or black. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. For the Christian, when the Christian says, yes, I'm going to do something, that should be good enough and we should do it. And when a person says, no, that should be good enough and we should not do it. We should not have to take an oath in a situation like that. And so Jesus is dealing with the everyday flippant oaths that people make. And, of course, those who are older can remember a day that when a handshake was all the, the uh, agreement you would need for something to be done. I don't know a world like that. I grew up in, in the 70s and 80s, and I don't know anything about that. You've got to have a lawyer. You've got to have... Uh, paperwork, you got to sign this, initial this, initial this, to, to get something done. But those who are older, you remember the day that a handshake is all it took. And the person would do it. You didn't have to look for them. That's someone who is a person of their word. When they say yes, they're going to do it, they're going to do it. And when they say no, then they're not going to do it. And so he's basically telling us that we need to be people of our word and uh, not to uh, swear falsely. We're not to swear falsely, but perform the work that is done uh, or the, the uh, oath that we take. And so he's dealing here with the flippant use of oaths. Oh, people, I, I've talked to people. They, they promise. They, they are guaranteed to be there next Sunday. You don't see them. I mean, they, they practically go through a ceremony in promising, I will be here. You don't ever see them again. <laughs> they're, they're, they are not a people of their word. You know, when I was younger, I, I tried to go pick up someone, one of my friends that I used to go to school with or whatever, to, to, to go to church service with me. And, oh yeah, I'll, I'll be ready. I will be ready. I'll, I'll be waiting for you. I get to the door and I knock on the door and they open the door, wipe and sleep from their eyes and, you know, barely know what day it is. So they're, they're not the people of their word. I mean, people's words aren't what it used to be. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. Mean what you say. Yes. Right. Where it's, it's, they aren't 
Right. Right. Aaron brought up uh, how that it goes back to our honor, what we say. It's important that we'll, uh, to have that attitude of honor, that we're honorable in our speech, that when we say something, that we're going to do something, when we say yes to something or no to something, that we mean it. And if we're people who are honorable people, uh, we will do that. I mean, how how the how our society would change if this kind of thinking permeated politics. When a person says they're not going to do something in politics, then they turn around and do it, or vice versa. And so, I mean, you can give example after example of people who have promised that they didn't do something, and it turned out they did do something. Or promised they wasn't going to do something and they did in the realm of politics. But that's a good point. We have to be honorable people and it will, it will go, it will be evident in our speech what we say. We will mean what we say, not be wishy-washy. Verses 38 through 42, he talks about uh, seeking vengeance or retaliation. He said, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. He is uh, quoting from Exodus 21, 24, Leviticus 24, 20, and Deuteronomy 19, 21. He says in verse 39, But I say to you, do not resist the one who, who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who begs you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. So Jesus here is talking about an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. What needs to be understood concerning this teaching in the Old Testament, and you often hear this, you know, if you watch westerns or movies like that, the, the people that are going to go out and take vengeance on those who hurt them, they say, no, the good book says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So we're going to go get them. We're going to get our posse and we're going to go kill them. We're going to hang them. And so they're quoting from the Old Testament. And they're misapplying that verse. That verse deals with a legal, judicial sentence. It's not personal vengeance. Look at the context of Deuteronomy chapter 21. What he's saying here is the punishment should fit the crime. That's what the law of Moses is talking about. Deuteronomy chapter uh, 21, nineteen twenty one. Sorry, I had the wrong chapter. Okay, look at verse. Start with verse 16. If a malice witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties to the dispute shall appear before the Lord. Before the priest, the judge, who are in office in those days, the judges shall inquire diligently. And if the witness is false witness and his accuser, his brother, um, and if the witness is a false witness and has a, accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he meant to do to his brother so that you shall purge the evil from your midst. The rest shall bear, shall hear and fear, and shall never again commit any such evil among you. Your eye shall not pity. It shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. That's not talking about if someone breaks my arm, i got a right to go out and break their arm. And when people use that passage that way, they're misusing it. It's talking about a court procedure. You go through the ju judicial system of the law of Moses, and if I, in a 
physical confrontation with someone, put someone's eye out, and I found guilt, I'm, I've been found guilty, my eye should be put out. The punishment should fit the crime according to the law of Moses. That's what it's saying. And so that's not talking about personal vengeance at all. And Jesus here in Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 42, is dealing with that, taking personal retaliation, personal vengeance. I have no right to, to do something to someone as they do to me to, to get them back or to seek vengeance. That's not my place. Now, I can call the police. I can go through the ju judicial system and have the crime punished that way because that's God's arrangement. But I don't have the right to go out and seek vengeance myself. So Jesus here is dealing with that. He says in verse 39, uh, Matthew 5, I say, do you not, I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And this is talking about a slap of insult. A slap of insult that's trying to provoke someone into a fight. But is that what we teach our children? Us big, tough Americans teach our children, if they hit you, you finish it. Isn't that what we teach them? If they strike you, you don't start the fight, but you finish it. In other words, you never start a fight, but if they hit you, it's open season. Pounce on them. That's what we teach our kids. That's what I was taught growing up. That's not the Lord's way. Now, I think it's because of pride. It's because of pride. We, 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 we have our pride hurt when we get slapped. We're humiliated. Well, Jesus said, turn the other cheek to him. Don't exactly lower yourself to that level. And when you say it's open season, if they hit you, it's open season. You pounce on them. You're, you're lowering yourself to that level. So, uh, parents, when we're teaching our kids, it's okay, you don't start the fight, but you finish it. Are we doing the Lord's will? Now, you think about this. Is he talking about self-defense here? No. He's not talking about self-defense here. What he's talking about here is someone trying to provoke you into a fight. Someone comes up and slaps you, and in that society, of course, I guess in any society... Getting slapped in the face is an insult. If someone comes up and slaps you, what's the natural reaction? You want to hurt them. You want to slap them back, right? Christ says, turn the other cheek. In other words, walk away from it. It takes a man or a woman to walk away from a situation. That takes guts. It's easy just to retaliate. That's easy. Well, Sean, are you a pacifist? You believe the person that's beaten down on you, you just sit there and take it? No, we're not talking about self-defense here. We're talking about someone who is provoking you to retaliate. Now, the reason why I say that is because there are some who are pacifists who believe that they cannot ever defend themselves. That if someone is trying to attack them or their family, that it would be wrong for them to physically take action to help. And I believe that Christ did not teach that. Look at Luke chapter 22. Luke 22, <clears throat> verses 35 through 38. Jesus is talking about the time is coming when they're going to fulfill the Great Commission to, to go into all the world and preach. He said to them, when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said nothing. That's the limited commission when they were just going around to the children of Israel. And they told, he told them, just don't take a money bag, knapsack, uh, or, or sandals. You'll be taken care of. Verse 36. He said to them, but now let the one who has a money bag take it and likewise a knapsack. And let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. Now, is Jesus raising an army? No. 
He's telling them, you use this sword for self-defense. You're about to go into all the world where it's a dangerous place. You take now a sword with you. Verse 37, For I tell you the Scriptures must be fulfilled in me. He who was numbered with the, trans- he was numbered with the transgressors for what is written about me must be fulfilled. Verse 38, And they said, Look, Lord, here are two swords. He says it is enough. Now, Jesus wasn't forming a militia. You don't form a militia with two swords. What's he talking about there? I believe he's talking about a sword of self-defense. He's not ordering his disciples to go out and kill Romans or to kill those who who reject his message. That sword would be used in a self-defense, in a defensive posture. So that does not in any way contradict what he's saying in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 verses 38 through 42 is talking about someone trying to get you in a fight, an argument a, a, that will escalate into something physical. And even if they strike you, trying to get you to retaliate, walk away from it. That's what we need to be teaching our kids. In verse 48, he talks about someone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. I believe in principle here he's talking about uh, there are some things you just let it go. It's not worth it. It's not worth it to, to get into these situations uh, of, of suing and countersuit and things of that nature. If someone has, has done you wrong in a lawsuit or something of that nature, yes, you can legally defend yourself, but some things you just let them go. It's not worth it. This world isn't our home anyway. If someone cheats you out of inheritance, you don't get the the, the property that you thought you were going to get, you don't get the items you think you're going to get in in your inheritance, your siblings cheat you out, let it go. You're going to a better place. It's your focus. Your focus. Look at verse 41. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. According to Roman law, if a Roman soldier was walking through a village, a Jewish village, and they had a backpack on, they could throw that backpack down and have one of those people of the village carry it with him one mile. They were obligated to carry that baggage for that Roman soldier. They were obligated to do it for one mile. Jesus said, go to. That's loving your enemy. Because the Jews hated the Romans. You do that extra. You go that second mile. Don't just fulfill your obligation. Go that extra mile. That's the phrase that we got in our society of going the extra mile, doing something extra, whether it be at work or whatever. It came from this concept here. Someone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Go, go an extra mile. Why? Wow, you're loving your enemy. And that could soften his heart. And on that second mile, you could talk talk to him about salvation. And you're showing that love to him that he may not ever return to you. But you're doing the right thing. You live above the world. And you do what's right. Go that extra mile with that person. You remember when Jesus fell under the weight of his cross and they forced Simon of Cyrene to carry it to Golgotha, Calvary? That's based on that law. The Roman soldier had a right to force someone standing by to carry that cross to the place of execution. Verse 42, Give to the one who begs you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. In other words, be willing to give. Now, there's wisdom in that. You don't give everything away to everyone who asks you. That's foolish. Uh, But you do help those who are in need. Be willing to share. Be willing to let people borrow. Help out your fellow man. You don't go take vengeance is basically what he's saying. And this goes into what he is saying in verses 43 through 48. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. The Old Testament did not say that. It did say, love your neighbor. In um, Leviticus 19 and verse 18, love your neighbor 
as yourself. It doesn't say hate your enemy. That was their interpretation of that. And, and in the Jewish thought, the only person that was their neighbor was their fellow Jew. That's why Jesus, when he gave the parable of the Good Samaritan, the hero of that parable was the Samaritan. Remember, the Jews hated the Samaritans. You love your neighbor as yourself. But you have heard that it is said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And in the context there, being perfect is you show this love to everyone because God unconditionally loves everyone. Now, His salvation is conditional, but He has an unconditional love for everyone. That's why Christ came into the world to save everyone. That's willing to uh, approach him on his terms. So you don't hate your enemies. You love your enemies. You pray for those who persecute you. You know that's not easy to do. Just like it's not easy to go that extra mile. Like it's not easy to, to offer the other cheek when someone slaps you. And sometimes we think that if someone's rude or unkind to us, that opens the door for us to be rude and unkind to them. That it somehow justifies us being rude and unkind to them. And that's just not the case. Two wrongs do not make a right. That's correct. Romans 12 and verse 18. <clears throat> Good passage to go along with this. Romans 12, we'll look at verse 17. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Verse 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Then he says in verse 19, do not avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Verse 20, uh, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For in doing so, you will be uh, keeping coals of fire on his head. Do not overcome. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You know, in this war in Iraq, there has been so much controversy with how we treat the prisoners, those who are terrorists and such. But I guarantee you. Those who are in American custody are treated far better than any of our soldiers that are captured by pretty much any nation of the world. Why? Because of these principles that have been a part of our society for over 200 plus years. I guarantee you that those who were captured are being treated far better in their captivity than they were when they were free. And so, it's this attitude that's been in our society that you take care of those who are your enemies. You help those who are in need. Yes, if you're in a political situation of, the, of a government that is at war, there is warfare going on, but if you have enemies that are captured, you treat them well. They're still your enemies. You don't let them go. But you treat them well. It's based on these principles. If we do that, verse 45, we will be the children of the Father. We'll be reflecting the character of God the Father in our life. Because He sends the sun and the rain on the good and the evil, the just and the unjust. God is so good to everyone. Everyone benefits from all the blessings of this earth. But not everyone is thankful and not everyone will be saved. But God has sent forth all these blessings. He says in verse 46, If you love those who love you, what reward have you? Even tax collectors do the same. 
tax collectors in the, in the society that Christ lived in were hated because who did they work for? Who? Romans. And they were seen as traitors collecting taxes from the people. From the Jewish people, their fellow countrymen, and giving it to the hated Romans. And so they were hated individuals. And it's interesting that Matthew was a tax collector. Christ chose a tax collector to be one of his apostles. So the gospel, the power of God can change people and can, and can bring new relationships. And he's saying here, if you just love those who love you, that's easy to do. It's easy to love people who love you. And he's not talking about emotional love. That's, that's the problem people have with this when he talks about love your enemies. How can I have good, warm, fuzzy feelings about someone who wants to kill me who's my enemies? He's not talking about warm, fuzzy, good feelings. He's talking about agape. The love that means I want the best for this individual, even though you're trying to kill me, even though you want to hurt me, even though you want to slander me, I'm going to do the best for you, and if you're in need, I want to help you. I want to help you. And so, it's the kind of love that is uh, the love that God had for us. You know, it's interesting. Years ago, there used to be a commercial. I think it was put on by the Mormons. They have their television commercials. And every once in a while, they get it right, as far as some things. The principle of, of, of showing an example of loving your enemy. There was this guy on this uh, mountain bike going down a road, and it was, there was puddles on the road. And a guy in a vehicle came by and purposely splashed him with water to the point where the guy fell off the bike. The car, the vehicle went down the road a little ways. The guy was laughing as they went down the road. The guy got off his bike, got onto his bike, got back on the road. A few miles down the road, that guy was broke down. And that guy on the bike could have just laughed at him and passed him by, but he stopped and he helped him. That's loving your enemy. Did he have good feelings towards that guy? No. But he set aside his emotions and he stopped to help that individual that did him wrong. Because that's the right thing to do. That's agape love. And do you think Jesus came into the world to save sinners because he had a good feeling about going to the cross and being crucified? No. It's not about feelings. But his love was there because he wanted them to be saved so that even when they were crucifying he, crucifying Him, He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's love. And He said, that's the kind of love you're to have. Verse 47, And if you greet only those who are your brethren, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? The Gentiles refer to those who are non-Jewish. Everyone that's not a, of the Jewish origin or Hebrew, they're Gentiles. He's saying people who are not even descendants of Abraham, they greet those who greet them. And so he says, you're to, you're to live above this. You, therefore, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Any question or comment about that? Right. That's that's the goal of it. Um, what, what was that scripture again? Proverbs 25, 21. Yes, if your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. And notice, this is from the Old Testament. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will heap coals, burning coals on his head. And the Lord will reward you. It's the right thing to do. And the thing that you do in, 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 in showing that love to your enemies will soften them. To some, it will just make them harder. But to some, it will soften them. And they see that love that you're showing them. 
and they will be converted, hopefully. You remember when Stephen preached that sermon in the book of Acts and they took him out and they stoned him to death? And in the process of killing him, he said, Father, Lord, do not lay this sin to their charge. He loved them even though they were killing him for saying nothing but the truth. It's one of those things that's easy to talk about, it's easy to preach about, it's easy to discuss, but it's so hard to put into action. The reason is we've got to have self-control and we have to deny ourself. And that's two things that we don't like to do. And so, that brings us into chapter 6, which we won't have time to go into. <coughs> But chapter 6, we'll be dealing with, as he says in verses 1 through 4, not doing your religion to be seen of men. Don't be like these religious people who are out there just to be seen by men. They want the praise of people. And so we'll talk about that next week, Lord willing.